Now, the second speaker today is Virginia Vasilevska William of Stanford University, and she will speak on the matrix monthly. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, okay. So, is this big enough, or should I write bigger? Yep, okay. So, matrix multiplication, as we remember from basic linear algebra, is uh, the following operation. Okay. I think it's okay. I threw away the other one because it didn't work. Okay, so uh, what we have, I'm going to work with uh, an infinite field in this talk. Uh, you can think of the complex numbers, for example. And uh, we have the matrices live in, let's say, B and C. So these are square matrices, then we can define uh, their product is this, so this is the typical notion of matrix multiplication, and this talk will be about how fast can we compute the product of two matrices. So when we talk about how fast we can compute matri uh, a, some problem, then I need to tell you what the model of computation is. So uh, just like we saw yesterday, the mod my model of computation will be So the model of computation are straight line programs or equivalent the arithmetic circuits. So we saw the definition of this yesterday, but I'm going to recall it again. So a straight line program is a sequence of uh, steps. So we have an input, which is a bunch of variables, x1 to xn. And the straight line program has steps um, 1, 2, whatever. And then in step i, from 1 to n, we're going to set, um, we have some value, we get, well, let's call it gi, which will be uh, just, we, put, we make it an input, and then for i greater than n, we're going to have uh, gi as some function of the previous ones. G dj, where j is less than i. And the functions that I'll be looking at will be as follows. Um, one, one type will be uh, gj equals gi plus gk, where i and k is less than j. So we take the sum of two uh, values already computed, or um, gi times gk, where they're less than this, or we could have uh, gj is, uh, you know, some constant in the underlying field, or in general it could be a constant times, a constant times gi, or a constant plus gi. Mm -hmm. So I have a bunch of these uh, operations, and you can think of these, uh, uh, this type of straight line program, you can also think of it as a directed graph, directed to cyclic graph. At the bottom, we have the input variables. Um, and this will be you know, G1 to GK, G, And then we have some gates. For example, a plus gate corresponds to summing. You can have uh, gates for multiplication. 
for example, like this, and, and so on. Um, you can think of the scalar products in addition is you can have them on the wires or you can have them in, in the gates. It doesn't matter. And then uh, the, this, uh, the graph goes from the bottom to the top. At the, at the top, we have some gate, some output gates. And each output gate outputs a polynomial because of the way we define it. So yesterday, we talked about time in terms of uh, the number of gates in, in the circuit. But today, we're going to define a, a slightly different no a notion of how good an, a computation is. And we'll show how to use this for matrix multiplication algorithms. So you could have. Uh, <clears throat> so cost of the computation okay the first one uh, let's say the time of, co of computing a polynomial f is the minimum number of gates let's say if well, let's assume that the uh, fanon is 2 okay and something else is the, is the minimum number of product gates. So what this means is that I assign uh, to a computation of this form uh, cost 1, and everything else has cost 0. All right. So this is also called the multiplicative complexity. And uh, <coughs> this type of measure is called the Ostrowski measure. OK. So when I an analyze uh, matrix multiplication algorithms, I'm typically uh, concerned with, with actually the length of this, this straight line program, actually the time to compute the whole thing. Uh, but I will also tell you how uh, getting a bound on this will allow us to get a bound on the time. Okay. So, good. So matrix multiplication uh, is a bilinear function. So you have uh, um, two matrices x and y, and they actually the, the product is just bilinear in, in x and y. Uh, and so it's natural to consider special a special case of this type of computation that's bilinear. So what does a bilinear algorithm for matrix multiplication look like? So first we compute products of the form of this. Uh, So I'm going to take a linear combination of the entries of the matrix A for some of these things in the field and multiply it by a linear combination of, of the matrix B. Okay, so you can think of this as uh, you know, only, uh, only one layer of product gates. And then finally, I'm going to set okay. so I compute a bunch of products of this form, and then then I express the product of the uh, the matrices in the ij coordinate is just a linear combination of these products. Okay. So 
if uh, the number of products is, uh, is R. So this goes from 1 to R. Then if I could express uh, matrix multiplication in this way with R products, then uh, the multiplicative complexity is in particular at most, uh, at most R. So the cost, uh, the cost becomes at most R. Uh, but then you may ask, um, could it be much better? And it turns out what you can show oops, is that for bilinear problems, not really. So for bilinear problems, uh, the, the bilinear complexity is at most twice the real complexity. So I'm going to call R, which I'll tell you why I care about this, which is the min number of products of a linear algorithm for n by n matrix multiplication. And because uh, matrix multiplication is a bilinear problem, uh, we have that The multiplicative complexity is at most this uh, general or bilinear function. So when we when we're talking about yeah. Oh, well, that's a question of whether you read this as oh. LRC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, anyway, so why do I write star here is because uh, we could also allow um, divisions, right? But it turns out that Strassen showed that for infinite fields, uh, divisions don't help you. So we can just restrict ourselves to uh, the multiplicative complexity. Okay, and, and moreover, when we talk about uh, circuits, we, we can restrict ourselves uh, to bilinear ones because, because of this constant um, dependence here. All right, so why, why am I talking about all of this? So let me, let me show you why. Well, it turns out that uh, we have this lemma, okay? If the rank, oh, if for some constants, K and R, the rank of matrix multiplication like this is at most R, then for all L greater than 1 integers, the rank of M to the K, KL is at most R to the L, okay? So once we have a bound on the rank of uh, small matrices, we can uh, make it, make a bound on the rank for larger ones and this time complexity. So now th this is where I also count the additions and multiplications. The time complexity is at most order. Right. So if we, if we write n to be k to the l, then the time complexity of, of this becomes order. Uh, this is big n. And log base k. So the reason why I care about the rank is because I can convert any bilinear algorithm uh, for small matrices into one for big ones, and this also implies a time bound, not only the, not only the multiplicative complexity, but also for 
the full, full complexity of the problem. So this is why we care about only multiplications. And how would you prove something like this? It's, it's not too hard. So let's look at a, a k to the L by k to the L matrix multiplication. What we can do is just block it into um, a k by k matrix with entries that are k to the L minus 1 by k to the L minus 1 blocks. And then we apply this algorithm here, uh, where these Aij and Bij's here are now blocks instead of entries in the field. And uh, we, then we compute this. So, so basically, what we get is um, we do this P lambda. Now this one is a k to the L minus 1 by k to the L minus 1. The same. And then we do the sum for Cij. Um, and now what's going on is when I need to compute these, uh, I just do it recursively. So what this means is um, I, until I get just one by one. Okay, so this, this immediately, um, so this builds uh, this big circuit. And in the end, um, if, if the number of products for computing something of k to the L minus 1 by k to the L minus 1 is r to the L minus 1, by induction, the number of products for the full thing is r to the L. Okay, so the argument is by induction. but what about the, the complete complexity when I also take the additions into account? So what happens then? Well, um, I'm going to use a different color for this. Then basically, I have to also take into account actually doing the sums over here. How many sums can there be? So there's, um, there's R of these products. number R products, then, then we have two of these to take care of, uh, of. There's at most k squared sums of Aij. And the, no, the summing of you know, the entries of a k to the L minus 1 by k to the L minus 1 matrix um, is this squared. And then finally, I have to do these sums, which is also R times k to the L minus 1 squared. So the number of sums is an order R K to the two, yeah. but um, R is a constant for our purposes. So in the end, I get that the time complexity of a K to the L is at most um, time. Um, it's most R times the time complexity of K to the L minus one uh, plus order R K to the two L. Okay, and then when you solve this, you again get that the time of k to the L is order uh, r to the L, which is exactly what we want. So this is this is um, so the reason why I only care about products is because additions are cheap for matrices; they just take linear time in their size. So this is exactly why I completely ignore them from now on. I only care about products. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now I can move on to the more interesting part. Okay, so now we're going to talk about tensors. Um, Every bilinear function, as we've seen, has a corresponding tensor course, um, that corresponds to it. So if we have some bilinear function from 
uh, some vector space. Oops. I'm going to e cross v and w, and this lies in the field to some u, and so on. Uh, okay, so then we have this tensor uh, corresponding to phi that lives in. So I'm going to use the coordinate notation. So the coordinate notation uh, says that if I pick a basis for u, v, and w, then, uh, then phi of u, v in the kth coordinate is just the sum of t, i, j, k of uh, u, i. So this is just a coordinate tensor that we saw before. For matrix multiplication, what do we have? So for matrix multiplication, the, the tensor is just, um, let's see, C i j equals, um, right? We just have this, but the tensor is going to be, um, I'm going to call this um, tensor of and then T I J K is just going to be uh, T I 1 I 2. J1, J2, K1, K2, which is going to be, as we saw before, only if I2 equals J1. Um, J2 has to be equal to K1. And then K2 has to equal to I1. All right. So. This is some bizarre notation, but this is the tensor of n, uh, n by n matrix multiplication. If we do k m n, it's going to be the tensor of k by m uh, by n by n matrix multiplication, and then the indices. Okay. So there's a direct com correspondence between uh, bilinear uh, maps and and uh, tensors, and I'm going to actually introduce this trilinear notation, uh, which is a little bit in more, e it's easier to work with. So here's a trilinear notation. Um, okay, the trilinear notation is the following. Over my, oh, you know, two, five, two, okay. So what does this mean? This means that uh, when I take the kth coordinate of the output, I just look at its coefficient, the sum of the i j, and, and this is what I'm computing. And actually, if you think about it, I'm taking the transpose here. So for matrix multiplication, the trilinear notation will just be So in the i case entry, uh, the, it's actually the uh, the sum over j of a i j b j k. This is a trilinear notation of uh, matrix multiplication. Okay. So now, if I I look at what's going on with these bilinear algorithms in terms of trilinear uh, notation, you will see something interesting going on. So
So the coefficient in front of zk is the sum over lambda of um, linear combinations of x. Um, so, in the trilinear notation, what happens is that um, when we compute, uh, basically we compute these products, each of these is one of our p lambdas from before, uh, over there, and then we, t we take the sum of the p lambdas here for each zk, where we, each one is multiplied by a coefficient. So this is exactly what's going on. But if you write it out um, a little bit better, you will see that this exactly corresponds to um, Tijk is just the sum of the lambda of theta lambda k, gamma lambda k. Um, and this is actually the sum of R rank one tensors. Okay? So this, um, I'm going to call, this is a triad. It's a rank one tensor where in the i, j, k uh, coordinate is exactly all lambda i, alpha i, beta j, gamma k, and this is rank one. And then the, by definition, the rank of a tensor is the minimum r such that t is a sum of r one tensor. So what's going on is now that uh, for bilinear algorithms, we have an exact correspondence between the rank and the course of the corresponding tensor and the multiplicative complexity of the bilinear function. So this is why we care about the rank of matrix uh, multiplication when it comes to algorithms. Okay, because we, we have, if we have a bound on the rank of some constant size matrix, we can convert it to an algorithm for arbitrary size matrices in the arithmetic circuit model. So now what I'll do is I'll define two uh, tensor operations, and uh, I'll, I'll use them. So, okay, first thing I'm going to define, uh, let's see, for tensor U is in M. And then another one, T prime is in K. B, C, I'm going to define uh, the tensor product is just going to be, uh, in coordinates, is going to be uh, something that it, it's going to live in KMA plus KMB plus KC. And then it's going to have uh, the following form. <coughs> its coordinates are just tuples, and it's just going to be okay. it's just a product. Uh, a nice uh, property of matrix multiplication is that, which I actually did this earlier, is that equals. Okay, so all this means is it, uh, it has a nice block structure. I can just block it, and, and the products of the blocks correspond to another matrix product. So that's all that means. Uh, and a nice property of the rank 
is that rank is always a product, is it most a product of ranks? Okay, and then we have um, the following other operation, which is just taking the direct sum of these things, and this thing is actually going to live in A, plus B, and then C, and it's much easier to look at it pictorially. I'll define it in a second, but basically what's going on is um, I'm going to look at this cube, and then the two tensors, I'm going to just put them uh, here. So this is this is T1, this T, okay, and the other one is going to be this one. So now, basically, what I do is I just plot them like this, and uh, you can write out the representation. But basically, if you write, if you write the, uh, this expression, you have new variables where the pairs are indices, and and they uh, pairs of indices, and they actually uh, use different variables, so the two tensors in the representation of this. Okay, and an another nice property of the rank is that okay and all right maybe I can I make a comment yeah uh, so the tensor product of two bilinear maps that you wrote down uh, from my lecture would be a flattening of the tensor product you know, for a very particular one which you wrote down. So they use the same symbol, but they're actually different oh, okay. different operations. Because the one previous would be in six factors, and really not three. Right? Um. Everything on the board is consistent. Yes, I'm consistent. Yeah, you're right. Is the last inequality rank of T plus rank of T minus? Oops. Uh, yeah. Sorry. of the rank that I'm going to tell you about, which is actually particularly nice for matrix multiplication, is that it's basically invariant under uh, permutation. So what does that mean? So if I were um, to look at uh, some permutation, uh, let me call it pi, uh, on three elements, then I can actually permute um, you know, the, the order in which things, things here are, uh, are written. So, um, right. what's the right formula here? And, and the right will be preserved. So basically, I will define some tensor pi t, uh, and then I'll say that the rank of pi t is the right t. Okay, so. T is defined as uh, that's if I have some uh, decomposition, there's always some decomposition. All I'm saying is if I have some decomposition where 
uh, these are, this is over uh, the vector space U, this over V, and this is over W, and then I can just swap U, V, and W, and this will, um, this will preserve the length. And I can similarly also um, uh, do permutations within the slices, and then it will still be, uh, it will still be true. And so, so this, what does this mean? For example, for the rank of matrix multiplication, so I can take any permutations of the dimensions and it will still be true. So one of these doesn't quite follow from what I've written, but it follows from the fact that uh, A B equals C infinitely if uh, B transpose A transpose C. So basically, uh, computing so the, the rank of a K by M by M by N matrix multiplication is the same uh, as any permutation of the dimensions here. And this is nice because it allows us to uh, symmetrize in the sequence S. So for example, if I have a, um, a bound like this, so the consequence If I get some nice uh, bound on rectangular matrix multiplication, I also get one per square. And then uh, this allows us to start from uh, di different constructions. So what we, what we know from Strassen, uh, what do we know about small matrices? So we know Strassen showed in a famous paper So this gave uh, um, a bound on um, matrix multiplication, which is the prime of Mn is order 2.81. Uh, so this exponent is called omega. Uh, so I'm going to define it finally now. This is what we study. And uh, for a long time, uh, the study of matrix multiplication in, uh, evolved around finding better and better bounds of the rank of small matrices, uh, maybe rectangular, and so, and so on. Uh, and This also corresponds to the uh, matrix multiplication exponent for, for in the time case. So this Strassen showed that omega is at most one. Then uh, on showed something. So something like that. Maybe I might. sort of got us stuck. Finding the bound, the rank for small matrices is actually a difficult problem as we've seen before, so a new idea was needed. And this is where, uh, where we, uh, last, in the last lecture we mentioned border rank, so this is where border rank comes in. So, Okay, what, uh, 
what do they? So they looked at two by two matrix multiplication. But they said, I don't want to compute the same. Okay. So interest here. And one can show that um, I just want to compute A plus Y C uh, X P plus Y D and Z A plus W C. I don't care about this one. As the rank of this tensor is known to be six. But it turns out that there exist tensors. So we show that there exists uh, the epsilon, there's some epsilon tensors, which I'll show in a second, such that as epsilon goes to zero, they tend <coughs> to T, which is this tensor here, uh, and uh, a rank five. So basically what's going on is that you have these tensors that approximate uh, this thing, and they, um, but they have smaller rank than we know as a lower bound. So let me, let me give you an explicit example so you can see this. And then I'll define border rank in a different way. Let's define All right, so I'm going to uh, compute the following products. Epsilon is some variable, but uh, you can set it to a small enough number if you want. turns out that if you look at what epsilon p2 plus epsilon p1 is over here, you will get exactly plus something. So this suppresses So I get exactly this thing, uh, plus an error of epsilon squared. So if I were to divide this expression by epsilon, I will get exactly what I want. And as epsilon goes to 0, this, uh, this will go to exactly uh, the value that I want. And you can write similar things for this and this. And you will get, for example, Two minus P four plus P five. All right. Again, so the epsilons here are exactly the same and. Uh, I get uh, that as epsilon goes to zero, I get exactly the same things. So now I can define the notion of border rank, right? um, and I will show you why we still care about border rank in terms of matrix multiplication. So.
So for some integer h, what I do is I, I get um, lambdas, uh, alpha, betas, and gammas just like with rank, except that now they're allowed to be uh, polynomials over <coughs> the same indeterminate epsilon over the same field. And then uh, I uh, can decompose the tensor, but now in this funny way, where when I take, when I take uh, the sum of these uh, tensors here, I actually get uh, t's, but uh, all up to an error of epsilon to h, this one. Okay, so this is this, and now I can define the border range. <coughs> it is is the minimum over h such that there is. Okay, so this is kind of a funny notion, but it turns out that there's this theorem. So is, is it clear that you can take a minimum and not an infimum? Um, well, not immediately. Okay. Yeah, but it, it's, a, yeah, it's, not, it's not immediate. Okay, so, right. Okay, so there's this theorem by the who show that if the border line of K and N is the most R, then omega is the most log or Uh, okay, so how would we prove this? So in order to prove this, I know I need some properties. And <coughs> is this equivalent to like the implication over here? Is it basically saying the same thing? Exactly. Okay. So what it's saying here is yeah that uh, well, it's equivalent to this, but in terms of border rank. And now I have border rank, and all I'm saying is that uh, instead of just working at rank, I can take an expression in terms of border rank and apply exactly the same techniques that I had before, but now using something that can be potentially smaller. As we saw, for for this beneath tensor over here, we had that the rank was 6, but the border rank was 5, so if I were to use border rank instead of rank, I would get a better bound of rank. This is, this is all the same. Okay. So, right. here's some properties of uh, border right? Um The first property is, uh, again, uh, for permutations of tensors, it's the same. the same as with the red. Uh, if I had uh, R, H, so this is nice. So this means that uh, if the exponent here of epsilon for t is h1 and the exponent of uh, uh, t prime is h, h2, then uh, when I take their tensor product, the exponent's only sum. So this will be useful. And then the third property is that, I don't know, actually, I'm going to use this, but. So this will be enough to prove this. 
And I, I'm just proving this so you can see a, a very simple way to, to prove bonds in the neighborhood. So how am I going to prove something like this? So the border rank um, at most R means that there exists some H, so the R, H, K, and N is at most R. So then I apply this property to I can also put it slices, but okay. So then I can symmetrize. So I take the tensor product of Kn min, uh, Mkn, and Mkn. And what I get is but now here I get the sum of the h's. So I only get 3h over here. So uh, I've, I've applied two operations. One is to symmetrize, so I flip the dimensions, and then I do a tensor product of three things, of K, M, N, uh, M, M, K, and then M, K, M. And when I multiply them like this, I, I get this tensor, where, and I only sum the exponents of the epsilons. Then uh, for um, take and so power. So what does that do? I'm going to uh, over here. I'm going to write it so it's easier. I'm going to write n, and then I'm going to take. Uh, to see. So basically, in the expression of border line, you, you can just compare uh, the coefficients and you can see that all you need to do is compute uh, only, uh, only those terms uh, whose powers in epsilon are exactly h, and there's at most that you to choose to in piece. So this is, this is an expression. All I'm going to care about is that this is a polynomial in h. Okay? So what happens now is I'm going to convert this into a rank. All right. So now I get the omega is at most bit of the log of, of S R K S of <coughs> N to the S. Okay? And then if you look at what's going on here, this is the limb of uh, 3s log R over S log N plus something that goes to zero. So this is a constant, and this is a constant, and this goes to zero as this goes to infinity. And so, uh, so then I have my theorem that uh, omega is at most three log r over log, which is an n was km, so this is infinity. So this is typically how one prove, proves the thing that is gets more and more complicated, you use more and more uh, equations, like you can use this, and so on. Uh, so here's one very important theorem that we use over and over. I'm actually not going to prove, but I'm going to tell you with this. This is the theorem of Schoenhade. And he said, if 
border rank of the following. So if I have a bound on the border rank of a direct sum of rectangular matrix multiplication tensors, um, then I can obtain the omega is one of mostly tau, where tau is a solution of Ki. And I tau equals R. So the important thing is once I have a bound in something more complicated than a single uh, multiplication, matrix multiplication tensor, I can derive a new bound on the matrix. And this, this is a very powerful tool that we use over and over. Um, it allowed uh, Schoenhage to prove that omega is less than 2.5, and then also allowed for the development of more and more techniques, such as Strassman's uh, laser method, and then the later copies of and so on. So let, let's take a break here, and uh, I'll take some questions. So uh, again, I'm going to give you a little intuition of how to prove such a thing. I'm not going to prove the full thing. Uh, let me just define some another thing about uh, something. This is a restriction. Okay. So um, I'm going to say that a tensor T is a restriction of T prime if uh, there exists, you know. Uh, linear functions, let's say this is linear functions where alpha takes uh, e prime to u, beta takes v prime to v, and gamma takes w prime to w. So these are linear functions. And then uh, t is actually so all this means is when I uh, when I write the decom decomposition of T prime into triads, then I, I apply alpha to the first one, beta to the second, one, gamma to the third one, and then I, I get T as the alpha. And a property, important property is that uh, first the rank of T <coughs> is, bless you, uh, same holds for the border rank. So if, uh, t, if T is a restriction of T prime, then its rank is at most the rank of T prime. Uh, and another property is that, um, what's the other one that was? Oh, yes. The other one is the following. The other property is that uh, let's define the following tensor R. Uh, it lives in R cross R cross R. Well, <laughs> And uh, one and zero everywhere else. So it's sort of a diagonal uh, thing. Then um, rank of t at most r if and only if uh, t is actually a restriction of r. This is an important property. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a relatively short proof of a simple version of this theorem using just this notion of restriction. I'm going to give you this, this lemma. Uh, if 
the border around curve. So the border rank of F, um, independent copies of N and N, so this just means a direct sum of F copies of F copies. Uh, if this is G, then I actually can get a bound on omega like this. So if you, if you look at there, all I'm saying is that K, I, M, I, and N, I are all N, and then you'll get exactly the same inequalities right there. So, all right. So to prove this, okay, it suffices to show this uh, the border rank of And the reason being is that then, um, then I'll get that the border rank of n to the s, n to the s, n to the s in particular is at most uh, this. And then I can take limits, and then I get that the omega is at most the limit. Well, I just go to infinity of this. Uh, okay, g of f. Uh, I'm sorry, why the second line holds? So I'm saying that if, um, implies this, because if I have a, a bound on the border rank of F copies of this, then in particular I have uh, an upper bound ah, for course, a single course, copy. Yeah, yeah. So I just drop this F, okay? And so I said that if I could prove this, then uh, I will get what I want. So then what I'll get that this will go to zero because I'll get S right here, here, and this will be um, log G of F. Yeah. The, the top, you're just erasing the F? Yeah. I'm just saying that if I have a bound on the uh, border rank of F copies of something, then, the then trivially I have a bound on one copy. So yeah, this is just. So I'm going to prove something stronger, and then I'll, I'll get what I want. Yeah. And to prove this, uh, I'm just going to do. Okay. Maybe at some moment you could put to mention this issue of additivity. So if we had additivity. Then it, it will be much simpler. So somehow uh, you have to do some gymnastics <laughs> yeah. because we don't know that or because it's even wrong. Yeah. So, uh, maybe it would be helpful to understand why it's kind of complicated. It's complicated. So uh, additivity is whether um, actually the border rank of the sum of, uh, of, uh, of copies is actually the sum of the, the ranks. But uh, if if it were, if they were equal, we wouldn't have to do it. Yes. Yeah. If it were added, we, we just could pull out this factor of f, and then yeah. we would be back in the old situation. But we then, don't then, work right. It's not. There. It's not. But it's, it's not. important to say. Yeah. It's important to say. Yeah, you're right. You're right. If it were added, then I could just say that yeah. this is equal to f and whatever, and then I could just immediately get j. But I, I can't do that because it's not true. So, so let's. Uh, Let's do the gymnastics. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Okay, so how do I prove that? Uh, I'm going to prove it by induction. It's true for um, s equals 1 yeah, by our assumption. 
I still can do this. So I'm going to prove it by induction. Assume it's true. Press minus one, and we'll work this to this. Um, okay. All right. So first, let's look at. restriction here, um, this thing, by our property that uh, the border rank, um, uh, the length is at most R if and only the blue, so I'm actually going to uh, do it for rank over here, and uh, actually just, uh, just as before, I'm not going to care about H's because they will disappear, like in the previous proof when I took limits. Uh, I can always, uh, if I have something for bordering, I can convert it to right with the polynomial blow in terms of H, and then I, in the end I'll be taking limits in S, so uh, the H will, because it's H, the polynomial in H of, H of S will become log, and then it'll, it'll go to zero. So it suffices actually to show it for a right. So I'm going to uh, do this, so the restriction of this. Um, by by a, uh, a property that the rank uh, is at most R is equivalent to uh, the tensor beer being a restriction. This becomes this. So this whole thing is a restriction of G S, uh, uh, which is you know, equal to G copy of that S. Okay, isomorphic anyway. And so then, okay, is it most? Uh, I'm now going to do this thing. I'm going to uh, say that I can have, it's, if I have more copies in the rank, it's only bigger. Uh, And then I'm going to say, well, yeah, but then this is exactly the rank of this. Tensor this thing. Okay, which then by induction is at most. Yeah. And so I get what I want. So what I do is I, I take my thing, I uh, represent it as a tensor product, I apply this restriction thing right here, and I get that the whole thing is a restriction of G copies of and yes. And then I argue that the rank is actually at most the rank of this nasty thing which is a tensor product of this diagonal tensor pair. But I think I apply the induction hypothesis here, and I get an upper bottom rank, and so there's some funny way to prove this. But it's, a, it's a very nice to have this notion of restriction. You can play around with it. Symbolically, and basically, um, the way Shanghai proves his theorem, he says, well, uh, tensors, at least isomorphism classes of tensors under this restriction notion, uh, form a ring, and then we can do operations in this ring with, uh, with that, and then, uh, and then things become much simpler. Okay. So in the remaining 15 minutes, I'm going to mention something about Copper's moving Winograd, and I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you two things about, one about lower bounds and one about uh, a different approach for matrix multiplication. Okay. 
So, uh, two minutes on copper smith vinegar. symmetric tensors and it has very nice properties, one of which is that its order rank is exactly Q plus 2. Uh, the upper bound of Q plus 2 is due to copper smith and women where the lower bound is because this tensor is quite size. So uh, it's very, a very nice thing. On top of this, each one of these here sum over i of this, sum over i of this, sum over i of this. These three things, okay, over here, and these three things over here, they're all matrix multiplications. So, for example, this one is a uh, 1Q1. This one is a Q11. And this one is a 1, whatever is left. And all of these are one one. one. Alright, so it's a nice thing where it's a sum of these matrix products and we would be done if you know if they happen to have these joint variable sets because then we could say that it's a direct sum. But the only problem is that this thing is not a direct sum of matrix products. So um, the entire machinery developed by Coppers and Leningrad and the rest of us is to Take this tensor, um, blow it up, take a huge tensor power of it, and then study it a little bit, form a restriction of this tensor, and say that in this restriction we, uh, we get a uh, direct sum of matrix products, and we analyze how large this collection is, and uh, what the dimensions of these matrix products are, and we obtain a bound of omega. The entire machinery is really sort of uh, it gets very messy, and we use constraint programs to actually uh, compute a nice restriction and in, uh, in the big tensor power. And uh, what enables us to get some better bounds of omega than what was known before is the following theorem from Copper, Smith, and Winograd. Uh, so they define value. Something and they prove a theorem that's analogous to uh, to Schoenhage, uh, Schoenhage's theorem, but in terms of these values. So the value of a tensor uh, tau is some some number between two uh, one, and then the value of a tensor uh, for this particular tau is some bizarre thing where you take a uh, limit of S of infinity, then you look at uh, the max, maybe it's a soup, I don't know, 
of sigma, so these are restrictions of t to the s, so something like this, uh, of a sum of matrix products. Under sigma, one to something, p, and k i n i n i to the tau. And then we take one over n. Oops, okay. So it's a very complicated expression. It happens to be uh, have nice properties. For example, t. And so the intuition actually is how, how close is this tensor to simulating a matrix product. This is essentially the intuition. And the theorem is that um, if um, the value of tau is at most r and something. Uh, oops. If t is are copies of some <coughs> of uh, some t prime, okay? So if, if, if t is f copies of the same tensor and the border rank of t is at most r, uh, r is greater than f, then omega is at most than 3 tau, uh, where now f times the value of tau t is r. So now instead of having, so in, in the Schoenhage theorem we had these sums of products of ki, mi, ni to the tau. Now we have this different notion of value and we have a different expression of what omega would be. So now it's a solution of this bizarre thing. So what we do in, in the approach is we take the copy smith Winograd tensor, we blow it up into a tensor power, we express each, um, this tensor power, we get a restriction and we express the value of this restriction uh, in terms of the value of some tensor that we know how to analyze. And, it, and then it becomes very messy because we have to write a constraint program to analyze the value of the tensor and then we have to solve this equation for this and this, this, this thing can be very nasty. It's a non-decreasing function of tau, but it's a constraint program that it's difficult to solve. So the entire approach becomes very nasty. So we can such things that I can't read well. So in definition of this value, the exponent is 1 over sigma here, over this? 1 over s. Less, 1 over okay. s. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. T prime doesn't show up like in the implication. So the, like, so the T is equal to the F copies of T prime, but T prime doesn't show. Sorry. That's the point is. So. so the point is now I uh, I have to find some decomposition of T into these T primes that I uh, into this T prime whose value I can analyze because of some reason, and then I have to solve this uh, to find out. Yeah. I'm sorry, I think you might start with the of this value. Um, yeah. So the tau is between two thirds and what is that? One. One. Uh, one. Because basically because of my days is mostly down. And, so and then it says p tau of t is the limit of s to infinity. Where uh, of the max over a sigma, where sigma are restrictions of t to the s, the s tensor power of the tensor of t, uh, that uh, restricted t to the s into a direct sum of matrix products. But then, how is the argument? So it's maximal or oh, so other okay. sigmas? Yeah. So each each restriction gets different dimensions for these matrix products, right? And so this. Sorry. Is it a number? Like it's, it's a measure of how much matrix multiplication this T can support under it, when you degenerate it. Yes. Okay, well, so if you recall, this, this thing was what was this thing?
was what was in the Schoenhage period. Is a sum over five in one scheme? So and then is this, is this in, in brackets the number? No, no, in, in the argument. Yeah. yeah, so in the brackets, this it's is like the three. product of the dimensions, k i, m i, n i, uh, to the tau power. Right? And, and what is the sigma? Uh, sigma is, you take the um, S tensor power of t. Sigma is a family, sigma ranges over all restrictions of this uh, tensor power into a direct sum of matrix products. So, my notation may be weird. I'm not raising them to this power, actually. It's just a notation, it's an index. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Oh. Sorry, I, could, I'm, I should put the index below, okay? So here's, this is I sigma, M sigma, okay? Oh, I see. So this is what's going on. So I, I take a restriction. Uh, these are the dimensions of the matrix products that I get under this restriction. Then I, I take this thing, which is exactly what we had in the Schoenhage theorem, okay? And then I take uh, 1 over S, you know, because Okay, and then, uh, yeah. And I take the limit, and, and this is what the value is. It's a kind of a complicated thing, but it, uh, it allows you to prove, uh, prove this theorem here. It, it's complicated to write down, but it's conceptually very simple. Conceptually, but all we're saying is I want to simulate a matrix product whose uh, uh, so the Schoenhage's theorem will give me exactly this exponent 3 tau. And I'm saying that I just take this restriction, I get this, and I apply Schoenhage's theorem on the That's all. So conception is very simple, um, and we we'll just apply it. And, and so okay. As you can see, this becomes uh, more and more complicated and a uh, little bit, uh, you know, we, we want to have a more formal discussion of what we're looking at. And actually what's going on here is that uh, there's actually some uh, paper that shows that if you restrict yourself to this particular tensor and uh, you only consider arguments of this form that use the notion of value like this, then uh, you cannot get better than two point three for q equals five and no more than two but two point two five. So let me write this down. So there's a new theorem that says essentially that you can't achieve omega equals two if you restrict yourself to this um, this argument. So uh, the theorem of uh, This recent, and they show that uh, if uh, call personal limit or apply. So this is not very formal, but I'll tell you what it means. And uh, TCW, where TCW is this tensor. This particular tensor. Then the best down on my you can prove is 2.25, which for me is nice. But this also means that if we restrict ourselves to any of the arguments that we have been using with this tensor, uh, we won't be able to reach omega equals 2. So I want to mention, uh, finally, uh, Sorry, Kiki. Is there a reason why you use bit exactly this tensor? Or is it nice in some sense? Or, uh, it's nice because we know exactly what its border rank is. We know that it's a sum of matrix progress. We, it, it has also some other nice structure, like, which is exploited, that uh, if you map the indices here between 1 and q to 1, uh, and the 1's to 0, then you get 1, 1, 0, and 
Um, basically, there's a particular block structure that you can exploit uh, to get the arguments to work out. And you can show that there's a lot of tensors that have this property, but we just don't know others for which we know such a nice bound on the board. If I just make a comment, more conceptually, the, all these things are, are sort of exploiting the gap between rank and border rank. Yeah. And, and this tensor has a huge gap between rank and border rank. And it's probably one of the largest gaps that's had been known, certainly at the time, that was known. So that's, that's sort of the secret that's not in the paper. Uh, what is it's 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 I don't know any formal proof of this, do you know? That if you have a huge gap, then something like that. Well, intuition. I, we could discuss it later. And do you want to run the and what's the rank? It's around double that, I think. 2Q plus something. Yeah. It's definitely a lot cuter. It's 2Q plus something. Anyway, so this is this is the state of the art of the upper bounds. There is a nice approach that doesn't use this framework based on group theory, which I, I will just give you uh, the notion, and I'm not going to give you a proof of it or anything. And then I'm going to give you one example of how one would prove actually prove lower bounds of the rank. So I will, can I take ten minutes over? Is it okay? That's good. Yeah, the discussion was supposed to go to twelve thirty. Oh, okay. Oh, so I have some more. Yes. So may I ask a question yeah. on the theorem by combining C terms? So I wonder what this means if we use a CW-like argument. Okay, let me tell you. It? Zeroing out. So all it takes, so the way it works, uh, these coverman renegade arguments, you take the tensor power and you, uh, you take blocks of the x, y, and z variables and you zero some of them out yes. and you obtain some restrictions. So they say if you restrict yourself to this type of argument where uh, you zero out stuff and you obtain the, tensor, uh, the, the sum of matrix products, then, uh, uh, then you won't be able to get better than it. But suppose I didn't do zero counts, I did some degeneration or something else into matrix parts, and this, they are going to work as far as I understand. Zeroing out mean is a kind of restriction? It's a kind of restriction. But so a restricted restriction. It's a restricted restriction. It means that I, <laughs> yeah, I take xi, if I set xi to zero, then I'm zeroing out uh, i, j, k, for t, i, j, k, for all that that's the type of restriction, just kill off one of the eyes. And yeah, so if I only use that to get a direct sum of matrix products and use this particular tensor, I won't be able to get that into the But uh, no matter what tensor power you use. No so matter your starting what tensor is the CW tensor, and then you can take any tensor power. Exactly. But you do the restrict restrictions. Exactly, exactly. And then you cannot get better than that. Yes. So, that's what I understood from your paper. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now three minutes on something called the group theoretic approach, which is very interesting to me. by Cohen and Newman's and another one by Cohen and Newman's, uh, Kleinberg, Segedi, and okay. okay, so then uh, what, what do they do? So instead of instead of doing all this stuff with uh, border rank and so on, we're going to take G to be some group, uh, and we're going to look at its uh, uh, algebra over the complex numbers, and we know that this is isomorphic 
Continue at the right. Uh, uh, the front. Oops. So, getting time. She's this, what we're going to do is we're going to define um, a property of a group such that we can embed matrix multiplication into products over this thing. And the nice thing about products over this thing is that we can actually compute products over CG in roughly Well, I'm just, you know, I do matrix multiplication over each of them, and no, that's just the sum. So if we could embed matrix multiplication into a product, so we'll take a matrix, we'll embed it into here, and the other matrix into here, perform the product over this, and then can extract the product of the two matrices from the product in here, then we would be done. We would actually get a bound on a matrix multiplication. So in order to do this, they define something property. So triple product property, and they, they say, um, well, G realizes A M N if there exists subsets S T group. In G, they don't have to be subsets, they're just subsets. So if there is this K, T, this M, and U, this N, uh, such that uh, <coughs> uh, whenever S times S inverse oops, S prime inverse T times T prime inverse times U. U prime inverse for S, S prime S, T, T prime and T, U, U prime and U equals 1. So whenever this, then it implies that S equals S prime, T equals T prime, and U equals 1. All right. So the triple pro product, product pro property says uh, that it, there exists subsets of the group such that whenever this holds for any six elements, then they have to be S, must be S prime, T must be T prime. So then, uh, then what you can see, so then what, what we'll do is that if we have such a group, then, then we can embed matrix multiplication. It's just a coordinate expression for what you wrote down earlier. That's the tensor corresponding to the multiplication in CG. You can zero out some entries and obtain the M N K matrix multiplication. Yes. Yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, well, let me just also write it like this. I can also embed If I look at
So why is this? Okay, because the SU inverse coefficient has S T has S T inverse times T prime inverse equals S U inverse. Okay, and this this is exactly if you look at it, it's, it's exactly the equals one. So this means that T inverse equals T prime. So the reason why we want this triple product product is to actually be able to embed matrix multiplication, and then um, what happens is that you can show um, that whenever G satisfies this uh, uh, this property, then you immediately get a bound on omega, and and that will be uh, that. Well, basically, you get what you want. I want to write something. We just follow from here. If G realizes M and N, then um, into the omega. Where the eyes of the So that's that's all. And then then what they do is they actually in the second paper they find a group that realizes uh, matrix product so that this uh, expression for that group actually gets something non-trivial. And the, the algorithm they obtain is actually completely different from anything we've seen before in terms of our, our other tools. So it's a very open question of whether this group theoretic approach can give us something completely different. Are they actually equivalent approaches or, you know. So the nice thing about what well, they, uh, they can do, they can actually reproduce omega less than 2.376 of their um, I'm not sure about the later developments, but probably. But we're running into the same problems, the same combinatorial problems that's not uh, universal. It's a similar problem. So now you're looking for a group with a particular property, as opposed to before we were looking for small tensors for which we understand the border, right? But somehow you need to solve the puzzles to define the was uh, also like the run into property of uh, finding you need to solve the puzzles, which was also defined in the combination of this. Must be relations some relations between these two approaches. So the I haven't defined uniquely solvable puzzles, but uniquely solvable puzzles are are in a sense very related to a paper by person. And uh, it's a restricted version of, from what I understand, from what we've been doing with the copper snow Anyway, this is not, I don't want to talk about this. I just wanted to make mention there is a different approach out there that we need to understand. Has anyone tried the medical stability of this other approach? Hmm? Uh, has anyone tried to implement the ceiling medical stability? Oh, from this one? The other, I actually, I don't know if anyone has actually tried uh, for. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. There is a paper by Olga Roth and Jim Demo. Well, did they do the group theoretical question? I thought they only had I don't think that it relies because it don't relies on the approach. What I was the question? The numerical it is, stability. It is known that for the yeah. Strassen like approach, there are problems in numerical stability. <laughs> Uh, of, uh, <coughs> depends, on, practice, depends on how you but, define numerical stability. But these, this kind yes, of algorithm so. doesn't kick in until it matrices the size of number yeah. of atoms in the universe. So this no, is I understand, I understand. But uh, uh, maybe the other approach actually gives something that for a certain size of matrices is better than, uh, say, Strassen's algorithm, yeah, which Strassen is actually implemented in, uh, in, in practice. It has been implemented. So. Um. So okay, just uh, for a certain notion of stability, you have to define it. It oh, yes. turns out that all these things are stable. I mean, even the group theoretic stuff doesn't matter sure. because they are all. They are, the, the, the framework is always that you have an, an algorithm for a specific dimension format, and then you do the tensoring. But this is all behind this. This is my understanding, and I think you conclude from that essentially. There is a paper about communication cost. Is that what you mean? No, no, I'm referring to this paper by uh, Jim Demo and Olga Holtz, where they 
proof that. So you can read it there and you can see what kind of definition of stability they use. Yeah, I know they have one for for um, uh, Schoenhagen's. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what copies are made, but yeah, I My understanding is that it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Ask the question. What kind of finite group would I use? Do you want me to tell you? Okay, let me, I'll just tell you what it is. I'm not going to give you the problem. But um, if you consider, here, here's the group. You say H is a symmetric group. And h squared is this squared, and this thing is cyclic. Sorry, cyclic, cyclic, t. Where the action, this is a semi-direct product, the action is to swap the two factors. They're, they want a group that's as close to abelian as possible, yet still robust enough to admit this degeneration. So it turns so out that this abelian groups won't give you brief anything. Yeah. So for this one, they get omega 2.9 or something of the sort. Nine. Nine. I don't know. <laughs> it's like 299 nine something. Really? No, I thought it was 2.9. Anyway, the it's less than three, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and it's different. So, okay. Uh, right. Lots of questions. I didn't have any coffee. So, okay. Now, finally, I'm going to tell you my... Okay, but I think the time is up, okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so well, I'm see. not going to tell you anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. And I think this is